Good morning, everyone. Pete Pardo here from Sea of Tranquility. Uh, I have a question for everybody. So what do Deep Purple, Rainbow, White Snake, Black Sabbath, Fleetwood Mac, Michael Schenker Group, list goes on and on. What do they all have in common? Okay. They all had the pleasure of working with a guy named Martin Birch throughout their career who helped either produce or engineer some or many of their classic albums. All right, Martin Burt sadly left us yesterday at the age of 71. Uh, Martin was born December 27, 1948. He passed away August 9th. Uh, a renowned and much beloved British album producer and engineer. And quite frankly, you know, the guy worked on so many albums that to this day remains so important to me. Uh, if you were, if you would have asked me, you know, back in the '80s or the '90s, you know, who is your favorite producer of a lot of the albums that you, you know, kind of love and grew up with? No brainer, Martin Birch, and still to this day, he's like one of my favorite producers of all time. I mean, all the Iron Maiden albums, the Deep Purple albums, like I said, the Rainbow stuff, the White Snake stuff. Uh, you know, Michael Schenker Group, you know, work with Gary Moore, Wishbone Ash. I mean, we're going to kind of take a look at a lot of the albums that uh, he worked on today that graced uh, the band's presence with his exceptional ear. You know, Martin, if you listen to a lot of the Martin Birch albums, the, the albums either produced or engineered by Martin over the years, I mean, we're going way back to 1969. You know, basically one of his, the first ones he ever worked on, I'm not sure if it was the first, but one of the first is uh, the Jeff Beck Group's uh, Beckola album. Okay. A lot of these classic albums that he worked on have that Martin Birch stamp. It's like they've got that kind of really kind of bright mid-range. They're kind of dry sounding, but, and, you know, very different from the, a lot of the productions that we would hear in the 80s and on, you know, the big, bombastic, you know, massively overproduced albums, or even, you know, the stuff that, like, Bob Ezrin did in the 70s. Very, very, Martin was very, very different. It's like he went in there to get the essence of the band's sound and keep it as kind of true to how they would play live as possible, okay? And I think a lot of those classic albums that he worked with, um, they all have that very Martin Birchy sound. It's kind of almost hard to pinpoint, but they had their stylistically, uh, or sound-wise, I should say, very, very similar. <clears throat> very similar. They're very potent, powerful, but no excess in them. I think that's kind of what I've always wanted to say about Martin's production and engineering. There's no excess. The, the essence, the absolute essence of each band that he worked with is there in the recording. No more, no less. And, you know, to me, uh, especially, you know, that's what I wanted to hear. And it's and, and it, in a lot of ways, that's still what I want to hear. It's like one of the reasons why I think, like, you know, Martin, after he worked uh, pretty exclusively with Iron Maiden throughout the 80s until the early 90s and then kind of retired from doing all this, it's like that kind of production style was kind of missing. Because a lot of the other guys who have made names for themselves, uh, you know, in, in that time period and, and to today, very different. All right, I think, uh, you know, Martin's touched very old school and for me, very much missed. Uh, but thankfully, we have a lot of these albums to kind of cherish forever uh, now that Martin is no longer with us. And I think, uh, like I said, a very sad day for a lot of folks who kind of grew up on a lot of these fantastic albums, these legendary albums, all of whom had that very special Martin Birch touch. So let's take a look at some of them, shall we? So again, uh, the Jeff Beck group, Beck Ola. Okay, obviously one of the early ones here. Uh, you know, maybe not as fantastic an album as the debut, but still quite good. You know, we got Spanish Boots is on here, Plinth, Water Down the Drain, Rice Pudding, uh, you know, Jeff Beck, Rod Stewart and the Boys. Classic, classic stuff. And, you know, interestingly enough, he, he made a name for himself working with a lot of the British hard rock and soon to be called heavy metal bands but yet he also worked with some non louder bands i mean fleetwood mac the early fleetwood mac we're talking about the peter green era here so uh he worked on the then play on album okay he worked on kiln house okay this is the album that they did right after peter green left much much more of a kind of uh you know 
bluesy old school rock and roll album with some, you know, you had the Jeremy Spencer and the Danny Kerwan thing here. The both guys were kind of leading the band at this point. Uh, Danny's songs are a little more, you know, kind of personal, a little more melodic and kind of, you know, maybe acoustic or bluesy in nature, whereas Jeremy Spencer's songs are much, you know, louder, vibrant, old time rock and roll, so to speak. Okay, and then you've got, uh, you know, the wonderful, you know, here we got the, into the Bob Welch years. So here we got Bear Trees. And these are fabulous albums. And I think what makes them so great is the fact that Martin was able to get the light and the shade from the band. So you had the kind of, you know, here you've got maybe they're leaving a lot of that bluesy nature behind. So here you've got, you know, Danny and uh, and Bob kind of taking control of the band. You know, Christine McVie now is fully a member of the band. And so you've got her compositions and vocals coming in. Uh, Mystery to Me, another fine, fine album. And I think these albums kind of really had that, really captured, you know, what was going on in the band at the time. You know, some rocking songs, still a little bit of bluesy stuff, but more kind of like, you know, soft rock. Okay. And just really kind of textured, atmospheric type material. All right. And Penguin as well. These are really fantastic albums. And, you know, we, we obviously probably need to do a whole show on Fleetwood Mac and specifically to give uh, a lot of love to the uh, that kind of mid-period. You know, because uh, most, most people, when they think of Fleetwood Mac, they think about, okay, the, the Buckingham Knicks years, which is, you know, the Fleetwood Mac self-titled album all the way to the present, okay, which, you know, massive band. But then a lot of folks really love the Peter Green era, <clears throat> the early Peter Green era, for its just British bluesiness, right, which is groundbreaking stuff, but I think the, the Bob Welch years in between are just as fascinating and really deserve more attention. But again, we're getting away from the whole uh, production aspect of it. But yeah, these albums are really, really well produced and I think have a just kind of uh, a lot of really cool textures. So what else? What else? Uh, let's see. So then, you know, he uh, starts working with a little band called Deep Purple, you know, um, and he, you know, one of the first things he worked with them on was the Concerto for Group and Orchestra, which I did not pull. But, uh, you know, then, of course, uh, you've got the famous In Rock album, which, uh, you know, one of the most legendary albums, <laughs> heavy rock albums of all time. And... Uh, you know, hard, the, the, the history uh, states that, um, you know, Hard Loving Man, one of the great songs on this album, was actually uh, dedicated to Martin Birch. Okay, for Martin Birch. He's the, he's the hard guy, hard, hard working guy, right? And they, you know, they really appreciated all he did. Oh, man, because, you know, again, we got, uh, let me get this one out of the slipcase. Uh, you got Fireball, of course. These are all, you know, just absolute drop dead, deep purple classics. Uh, that, of course, all had Martin's hand in them. Uh, got Machine Head. You know, once we get through this episode and you, and you just start to realize all of the legendary albums that this guy worked on, it's just mind-boggling. Okay, Made in Japan. Who do we think we are? You know, long string here with Deep Purple and Burn. You know, basically, with Purple and Iron Maiden, you have, uh, you know, Martin basically did so much with both bands in each successive decade. Stormbringer. Made in Europe. And, of course, Come Taste the Band, which is basically when his, uh, you know, long-standing association with, uh, with Deep Purple kind of ended, right? But, you know what? Sorted, but not, because... David Coverdale, of course, went on to form Whitesnake, and he just kind of continued his relationship with David, and, you know, John Lloyd and Ian Pace were also part of that band as well. So you've got, uh, you know, the Snakebite album. You've got uh, Trouble. He worked on uh, Love Hunter. And if you, you know, if you've listened to a lot of these albums and you know, especially like these White Snake albums, they sound very similar to a lot of those Deep Purple albums we talked about, sonically speaking. Okay, so of course, you know, different band, obviously. But the, a lot of these albums, they had that Martin Burt stamp on them. And there's just no mistaking it. Ready and willing. Come and get it. Saints and Sinners. And, of course slide it in which would be the last album that he would work on and you know ironically 
uh, you listen to the White Snake albums that come after this, very, very different. <clears throat> very, very different. You have different bandmates, obviously, but the production, very, very different. Like that 1987 album, huge, bombastic, just uh, guitars and vocals way out front. It's just it's absolutely huge, which was a trademark of a lot of uh, 80s album productions. And that was not really Martin's thing. Okay. So it's like, you know, a lot of these Martin Birch produced or engineered albums, it's like, you know, you're getting the band. All right. You know, it, it's true to the sound of the band. Band go in the studio, Martin produces and records them. And the essence of what the band is all about is right there in the recording. There's no extra this, there's no extra this. We're not going to sweeten up this and do that. It wasn't what he was all about. And I think that that's, that's one of the things I always loved about his. Uh, the stuff that he, the albums that he worked on, they were very, very true and honest, very honest to what to the band's core sound. Uh, how about Richie Blackmore's Rainbow, right? So uh, you've got um, the first album. Again, keeping in the Deep Purple family. Deep Purple's kind of no more here, obviously, but he's keeping in the family. Uh, of course, the Rainbow Rising. Okay. Got the On Stage album. And of course, Long Live Rock and Roll. That would end his association with Rainbow because Roger Glover, of course, came on board. And Roger Glover would produce the band as well as be the bass player, right? So what else we got? Uh, how about, uh, let's go cross camps here. Let's go from the Deep Purple family to the Black Sabbath family. All right, for Heaven and Hell. As well as Mob Rules. A little bit different production techniques here. Uh, I think uh, the this is a pretty. Um, I, I keep using. I like. I, I always kind of associate that kind of dry production sound with some of Martin's works, specifically on this album. Absolutely breathtaking, great songs. But I think that here we a little bit beefier, a little more bottom end to this particular album. I think, but both have that Martin Birch stamp. Okay. Both fantastic, fantastic productions. Uh, how about Michael Schenker Group, Assault Attack? This, I mean, you know, it's like I almost, as much as I love the production on those first two uh, MSG albums, I absolutely adore this one. And I always wish that Martin would have worked a little bit more with this band, and with Michael in particular. Okay, the one and only uh, album with Graham Bonnet on lead vocals. Well, for the entire album, he's since worked with Michael once again. Uh, let's see. So we got some, some smaller catalogs here. How about uh, Wishbone Ash? Self-titled debut. Okay, as Martin is engineer. Uh, Pilgrimage. As well as the legendary Argus. Fantastic stuff. Fantastic stuff. Warriors to Cult, Cultosaurus Erectus. And again, if you've uh, watched an episode, a Blue Oyster Cult themed episode that I did with Martin Popoff a few weeks back, maybe about a month or so ago, we talked a little bit about how Cultosaurus Erectus and Fire of Unknown Origin sound very different from the Blue Oyster Cult albums that came before and after it. And it's because of the production of Martin Birch, all right? He's got that distinct sound, and here he is employing it with these guys. And these are fantastic albums. They sound great. They're just very different from the other Blue Oyster Cult albums around it. Okay. Uh, how about uh, Peter Banks and his band Flash? All right. British progressive rock band Flash. There's the debut. And here we have the uh, second album. Actually, no, this is Flash. This is And this is uh, In the Can. Sorry. Yeah, I know. Terrible album covers. <laughs> terrible, terrible. But you know what? This is still pretty good stuff. And, uh, you know, amazingly here he is kind of lending his abilities and his techniques to more of a progressive rock band. So here, you know, kind of the outliers in a lot of what we're talking about here is, you know, Flash and maybe Wishbone Ash. Uh, he's, you know, predominantly worked with a lot of heavier acts, you know, with Fleetwood Mac, more on the bluesy side, same thing with Jeff Beck. But a lot of what we've been talking about here are a lot more heavier, heavier acts. Uh, and here we got some other, like, kind of like one offs and things. So we got uh, the Gary Moore Band, Grinding Stone, very, very early release from Gary. With Martin's touch on it. Here we got uh, the Groundhogs, Thank Christ for the Bomb. Martin actually worked with the Groundhogs quite a bit. Very, very cool British blues rock band not that different from Fleetwood Mac okay uh, here we got the faces long player 
engineered by Martin, produced by the band. And then here, a very cool hard rock rarity, uh, the self-titled release from the band Toad. What a heavy, heavy early 70s album by this underrated, practically unknown band. It's massive, massive riffing going on in this album. One of the unsung heavy rock albums of the early 70s. And again, Martin had his hand in that. So the only real band we haven't touched on yet is uh, this little band called Iron Maiden who he, you know, throughout the 80s, that was the band he worked with. And I think, you know, he had done so much in the late 60s and throughout the 70s that I think he just kind of like struck up a relationship with Iron Maiden. It really worked well. They loved working with each other. The fans dug the albums and they made that a relationship that lasted, you know, pretty much a decade. Okay, and then Martin said, okay, time for me to retire. So the first album they worked on together, arguably one of the best, right, Killers. I remember the first time I heard this album, I was like, holy crap, I don't really know who know this band, but because, uh, you know, the debut came out kind of very quietly, and then this came out not long afterwards, and for most of us, this is the album that caught our attention to this band, and then we went and gobbled up the debut, <clears throat> and I, I love, this is one of my favorite Martin Burke uh, Birch Productions right here, and it's just, uh, again, similar kind of feel to a lot of these things, although he had a much more, I mean, you know, this is a different beast, this band. So he was able to kind of do some new new tricks and things with these guys based on their abilities, based on the you know the songwriting. Uh, Number of the Beast, of course. Peace of Mind, another one of my favorite productions by him. Again, you know, if you listen to those like those Sabbath albums, and you listen to these, very similar feel, sonically speaking. Okay. Power Slave. You know, the Live After Death album, Somewhere in Time, you know, Maiden's here trying to incorporate some new sounds and up, to, you know, guitar synthesizers and, you know, change things up a little bit and Martin's right there alongside with them and I think, you know, really helped them kind of achieve what they wanted to do. Seventh Son of a Seventh Son. And also No Prayer for the Dying and Fear of the Dark. Okay, so, you know, since then the band have moved on, worked with other producers. Um, but I think, you know, this, their, their legacy, their stamp is always going to be tied towards Martin Burt. So, you know, I mean, there you have like a whole bunch of amazing, amazing records that these bands were able to create with the help in the studio of a guy named Martin Burt, who I think just kind of helped them take their music and really give it an honest impression added to wax added to cd uh for the listeners to enjoy and then know that you're getting the essence of that band you're not getting all sorts of studio trickery and wizardry you're not getting uh, all the stuff that shouldn't be there it's like this is the band these are the songs that they're presenting this is the band playing them presenting them it's honest it's truthful and it's all about the music, right? It's just all about the music and those bands and their musicianship, okay? And uh, that's, you know, that's the mark of a really great producer. And there's, granted, there's a, there's a lot of other fantastic producers who have been able to kind of manipulate sound and add in this bit of the extra and this bit of extra and, you know, give these huge multi-track choruses and all that chorus sort of stuff. And there's some bands that, you know, have obviously really benefited from having that sort of production techniques. But these bands, the essence of these bands, you know, all these bands we talked about uh, were live bands. Okay, that's that's where they, and, and that's the kind of, you know, the sound that Martin was able to get in the studio, I think. True to what you would hear if you were seeing them on stage. Okay. Uh, very, very different from the Mutt Langs and the Bob Ezrins of the world and, you know, all the other ones that we, we, we know and we love them too, right? But Martin's style is a little bit different, and I think it just really worked with these bands. Really worked quite a bit. So Martin Birch uh, has left us, sadly, at the age of 71. Uh, as of yet, no cause of death has been determined or announced. And um, it's just a sad day. Like I said, this is uh, he was the guy has always been the guy for me. And uh, anytime that anybody asks me or I'm in a conversation about my favorite producers of all time, his name always comes up. 
because so many of these albums we just showed and talked about here are man just ingrained in my soul and i'm sure with a lot of you as well so um yeah there you have it martin we miss you we love you you're up there talking to uh you know many of the greats that you've worked with that are no longer with us he's up there chatting with uh, peter green and he's up there chatting with tommy bolin and uh you know so many of these ronnie james dio and john lord and yeah so on so on the list goes on so uh, we'll always re have their music we'll always remember them so this is on the web at www.seatranquility.org we're on facebook we're on twitter of course we're here on the mighty youtube all the damn time thanks everybody for uh coming and hanging out here with me this morning to kind of talk about a uh, an amazing amazing producer and engineer and uh stay tuned for more stuff so we've got uh, coming up shortly uh, we're going to start up by popular request. We've had a couple people who have uh, asked for this over and over again for months. And one person yesterday who kind of told me, I've asked for this four times already. When are you going to give in? So now that we're going through kind of COVID-19 and there's no live music really happening and stuff like that. So a few people have said, well, Pete, we know you have an extensive live concert DVD and Blu-ray <clears throat> collection. Why don't you like do like your 10 favorite, uh, you know, concert dvds or blu-rays or 20 or whatever and so on and so forth and i kind of thought about it and i said you know instead of doing like one show uh what i'm going to do is how about every day i give you a dvd slash blu-ray a concert dvd blu-ray recommendation for you to go check out and i'll do that every day we're talking you know three three to five minute little quick little videos every day pull one from my collection that i really love show it talk about it and why you should check it out as a way for you guys to go and discover hopefully some of these great live performances that you've never seen before seeing as we can't go out and watch live performances from our favorite bands right so that's what we're going to start doing that'll be happening this morning uh <clears throat> i'm going to take a couple day break from the uh deep cut dives only because i've got a bunch on the schedule that i that i'm going to be doing with some guest stars and uh we haven't kind of coordinated dates and times yet to do them and i've had a i had a busy weekend with family here all weekend for a couple days so it's like i'm just i'm a little kind of out of whack right so that's happening tonight uh nick franco's coming on the show we're going to do a uh, rank in the albums of finnish progressive metal band death metal band folk metal band they kind of do it all amorphous so that is happening tonight so stay tuned for that and then uh, all sorts of things going on this weekend or this week i should say so stay tuned for all of it we'll see you later Bye bye